Good morning. It's encouragement to see everyone again. Last week, me and my family were down in Merced. We assembled down there, heard a great lesson on the women in the assembly and the encouragement that they also bring. Um, and they mentioned down there, which we could also say here, that there's not a person here, whether woman or child, that we could not say that at one time they have not encouraged us or brought us joy um, and enabled us to further continue serving God. And so it is truly a blessing to see everyone here. This morning's lesson is regarding the second coming of Jesus. And so again, before we get started on the lesson, just want to encourage everyone to continue um, searching God's word and seeking to obey it. We went to a soccer game for Aurora's family, and it was opening day, and there's all these little kids around just a few years older than Josiah. And so it shows those children aren't here this morning. Those children are learning something other than the truth. So we do have a challenge ahead of us and and creating a light for a dark world, for those who will not obey the truth. And so us who have grown up, we are still surrounded by those other little kids who grew up with us, and they are not here. So it's just an encouragement for us to see the challenge before us, but it is made possible. Um, We have the truth revealed to us, and it's just encouraging to see everyone here um, seeking the truth this morning. And so today we're going to be looking at some of the verses regarding the second coming of Jesus. And so when we say second, we're not talking about... um, other comings before we read that in the Old Testament, there were figurative comings of the Lord. In Isaiah 19, we read about the Lord coming into Egypt to bring judgment upon Egypt. When this says second coming, that means there's only ever been one before like that. When we read about the figurative comings, there's been many like that. So this second coming means that there's only been one before it. And it's reference to Jesus being born, Jesus coming from heaven. When we familiarize ourselves with the teachings of the New Testament. We learn about the Godhead, about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three separate beings, each wear the title of God. In the same way, a husband and a wife are two separate beings. Each one wears the, the title of human. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit are three beings equal in nature, and each is termed as God. And so Jesus existed before he was born. In John 16, he touches on that. He existed before he was born in heaven um, with the Father. He came forth from heaven, from the Father. That's his first coming. He came the first time to be born of the Virgin Mary. And when it says he came from the Father, he came into the world. He says, I came forth from the Father and am coming to the world. What's that mean? That means he wasn't in the world. He was in heaven. He came into the world. And he says, again, I leave the world. And I go to the father. Jesus, the first time that he came to earth, he was born a Jew. He was the Jewish Messiah. The leaders rejected him as the follower, as the son of God. But Jesus had a great following who believed in him as the son of God. The Jewish leaders rejected Jesus as the son of God. And so they brought Jesus before the high priest and they asked him, are you the son of the blessed, which is the son of God? And he says, I am. And so they cried out blasphemy. So Jesus came into the world as the son of God. And so that means who was Jesus's father? It wasn't Joseph. His mother was Mary. He was born a human. But who is his father? It was God. Jesus is the son of God. And so it wasn't blasphemy blasphemy for him to be claiming the title of son of God because he didn't have an earthly father. He was born of a virgin. God the father was his father. And they put him to death for blasphemy. For saying that. And so that's what we still preach and teach today. Jesus is the son of God. The truth did not change. And so Jesus came into the world to um, to reveal this truth to the world. He lived a sinless life, became that sin offering for us. He died, was dead for three days. He resurrected out of Hades. He walked the earth for 40 days and then he ascended into heaven where he once was before And this time when he ascended into heaven, he sat down on God's throne. And so Jesus knew the purpose why he came into the world. He knew he had to fulfill the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. There was things which he needed to accomplish before he died. That way, um, that's why we read time and time again, Jesus says, my time is not yet ready. But he tells his brothers, your time is always ready. Jesus had things to fulfill before he died. Then when he died and resurrected and eventually ascended into heaven, that's what Jesus says. This Jesus spoke these words before he died. And he says, I came forth from the father 
am come into the world, again, I leave the world and go to the Father. Here's his first coming. And in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28, this is where we read, this is where we come up with the term, the second coming of Christ. It's from Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. And it says there, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. That's talking about Jesus's crucifixion on the cross. Jesus bore our sins in his body. His blood was shed for our forgiveness. That was the purpose of his first coming. And it says to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear. It says a second time apart from sin for salvation. And when it says Jesus will appear apart from sin, that's referencing Jesus is going to come from heaven apart from a sin offering. The purpose of his first coming was to appear to be that sin offering. Jesus' second coming isn't going to be for that sin offering. That's already accomplished through his first coming. But what's the purpose of his second coming from heaven? That's to bring eternal salvation to all who live by faith. And so we, as Christians, under this time period, Jesus already came the first time. We get to experience those benefits. We get to experience the benefits of both comings of Christ. His first coming, what happened? We've been reconciled to God. We have the forgiveness of our sins. We have access to the Father. We have the blessings under the New Testament. And Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 says, due to the first coming of Christ, and his death and resurrection, his ascension into heaven, we have all spiritual blessings. So because Jesus came the first time and he bore our sins, we experience the benefits of that. And it says, though, that wasn't it. He's not done. He'll appear a second time to bring us eternal salvation. We read about Jesus when he ascended into heaven. Upon his ascension into heaven, we have angels tell the apostles that Jesus has a promise of another return out of heaven. In Acts, uh, the book of Acts, we're studying this. Um, I know a lot of us, myself included, can't wait till we can begin studying this book again. It's a great encouragement for us. And so we've learned a lot of different things throughout this book. If uh, those of us who aren't here for that would encourage everyone to assemble when we do this. And so we have learned, though, about the establishment of the church. And we know that wasn't until Acts chapter two. So this is Acts chapter one. This is before the church was established. This was Jesus. By this point in Acts chapter one, he already died. He resurrected, but he has not yet ascended into heaven. And so we're reading about Jesus's ascension into heaven right before he sits down on God's throne and the church is established. And he tells his apostles, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. We read about that throughout the book of Acts. We read that they accomplished this great commission that was given to them. Colossians tells us that the gospel was preached to every creature under heaven. The book of Acts shows us that there was the church in Jerusalem up until Acts chapter 8. The persecution came against the church in Jerusalem. And so those Christians spread throughout Judea and Samaria and then to the ends of the earth. The gospel was preached to the whole world within that first century. We read about all that happening. But then here we have a promise which has not yet occurred, which we are still waiting for today. And it's the promise of Jesus's second coming from out of heaven. He came the first time, born with a body, died for our sins, and then he went to heaven. But we also have a promise of his second coming from heaven. And it says, now, when Jesus had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up. A cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, he went up to heaven. Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which we know were the angels. The two angels appeared to them who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go. So upon Jesus's ascension into heaven, they're given the promise, hey, he's going to come again out of heaven. Hebrews 9, 28 calls that the second time. He's going to come out of heaven the second time. And so this is the promise which is given to us that Jesus ascended into heaven and we have one more promise in store for us that Jesus will descend once again from heaven. 
1 Thessalonians 4, 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And so we talked about how in the Old Testament, Isaiah 19 talked about God coming into Egypt to judge. And that was a figurative coming of God. But here, this isn't a figurative coming. It says the Lord himself, Jesus himself will descend from heaven. Just as this same Jesus ascended into heaven, this same Jesus, the Lord himself, will once again descend from heaven. In Hebrews 9, 28, lots of other verses teach us that's to resurrect the dead. We're going to go over it in this lesson to destroy the earth and to give us the promise of eternal life, to give us uh, those spiritual bodies. We're going to look at some of this this morning. John chapter 21, verses, uh, verse 14, and Colossians chapter 3, verse 4, we read here about the two different comings of Christ, and it's the same Greek word in both, and it says, after Jesus resurrected from the dead, it says, this is now the third time Jesus showed himself, he appeared to his disciples after he had been raised from the dead. So when Jesus was raised from the dead, he appeared to his disciples. But once Jesus ascended into heaven, we still have a promise that Jesus is going to appear again. He appeared after he resurrected from the dead. He went into heaven, but we still have that promise for us that Jesus will once again appear the second time. Colossians chapter 3 verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. So this is the idea. Christ comes. We're going to meet him in the air. We're going to look at some of that this morning. Um, but when Christ appears, we will appear with him. Christ has not yet appeared that second time. And the purpose of putting these two verses together is that we have a promise after Jesus went into heaven that he will appear again. And when it says you'll appear with him in glory, that is reference to symbolic the idea of we are going to receive eternal life. We read about those glorious bodies which will be given to us at Christ coming from heaven. We'll look at some of that this morning. Um, we're focused, our focus this morning is on the second coming of Jesus Christ from heaven. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4 and 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8 also reveal to us um, some promises associated with this appearing of Jesus from heaven. And it says, and when the chief shepherd appears, but hold on, I thought he already appeared. Well, there's a promise. Remember, Jesus went into heaven. He's going to appear again. And when the chief shepherd, that's reference to Jesus, when he appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. If you read the first chapter, first Peter chapter one, verse, I believe it's chapter three, or I'm sorry, first Peter chapter one, it's verse four, I'm pretty sure where it says that we have an inheritance in heaven undefiled, which does not fade away. So when it says we're going to receive a crown of glory that does not fade away, you know what that has reference to? Going to heaven, receiving eternal life, having those eternal bodies, which will be given to us. This is just none other reference than, hey, Jesus is going to appear from heaven. You're going to He's going to receive you into heaven and you're going to go into heaven where you have treasure, which does not end. And you're going to receive eternal life. Second Timothy chapter four, verse eight tells us this isn't a promise just for them. This is a promise to all who love the appearing of Jesus. And so the idea, the idea is also that at the appearance of Jesus, individuals will be given a crown. And here it calls the crown of glory which we know is a reference to that's when you receive eternal life. Here it's called a crown of righteousness. But again, this is none other reference to we are going to receive eternal life. It says, henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, this is reference to Jesus, shall give me at that day. There's going to be a single day in history has not ha happened yet. There's going to be a single day in which Jesus comes and gives the crowns of righteousness, the crowns of glory, eternal life. And here we have told to us who those crowns will be given to. I think it's uh, Carlos has mentioned up here before, and I like the idea of it, just that we have an open book test. We have the book in front of us. And so God has told us that there's going to be a crown of righteousness given. There's going to be a pass given 
to those who pass this test. And so it tells us, how are we going to pass this test? How do we get that crown of righteousness at that day? And it says, he's not only going to give me that crown, but to all of them also that love his appearing. And so we read Jesus has had two appearances, his first one, which already took place. And so we need to ask ourselves, do we love that? Do we love the fact that Jesus came? He lived a life that we can read about. Do we love that? We have it recorded for us how he lived. He died for our sins. Do we love that Jesus died for us? This crown is going to be given to those who loved his appearing. If you didn't love his first appearing, guess what? You're not going to love his second appearing. His second appearing is meant to give salvation to those who love his first appearing. And if you don't love his first appearing, his second appearing tells us he's going to judge. He's going to condemn. He's the righteous judge. So if we are talking about loving his second appearing, we first need to love his first appearance. And so do we love the idea that Jesus appeared the first time? And here's a question. Do we love the idea that Jesus is going to appear the second time? We read about all these promises which are given to us. Christ is going to appear. We're going to appear with him in glory. Are we looking forward to that? We should. We're going to receive a crown of glory that does not fade away. Do we love that idea? And if we love it so much, are we keeping that with ourselves? We should be sharing it. Jesus didn't give us all these teachings through the apostles and prophets that wrote the New Testament to keep to ourselves. Look, this is a a promise which is given to all of them that love his appearing. How are individuals going to know about the first appearing of Jesus? If someone tells them about it, somebody in order for us to hear the gospel, somebody had to tell us. And so this is just an encouragement. If you love the truth, if you love the idea that Jesus came, let's share it with a friend. Let's share it with a stranger um, because Jesus is going to appear again. And not only them, but us also, we're going to have to stand before the righteous judge and give account for what we do. And so do we really love his appearing? I hope so. Um, The Bible tells us how to show our love for his uh, appearance, his coming. And so let's continue studying uh, on our own and continuing to learn why we should love Jesus's appearing. And so here in Titus chapter two, we have written for us regarding Jesus's coming from heaven. And so this is a beautiful thing because this is what God wants every baby to grow up learning. Just as Paul said that he was separated from his mother's womb to have Christ revealed in him. How did Paul have Christ revealed through him? He preached Christ. He said, Jesus is the Christ. God wants to reveal Christ through us. He wants us to tell others that Jesus is the Christ and also not only just have a verbal communication about who the Christ is. God wants Christ to live in us through faith. When we obey the teachings given to us by Jesus, that's how Jesus uh, lives within us. And so here we read about this blessed hope, this glorious appearing of Jesus Christ who gave himself for us. And so look at this. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in the present age. This is referenced. The grace of God is the word of God. The word of God has brought salvation. The word of God teaches us and the word of God is given to us by the grace of God revealed through the spirit of God. But look at this, denying ungodliness and worldly lust. You know, I just learned and it says to live soberly in the, in the, uh, the Greek word in first Peter chapter five, when it says be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil is on a, uh, on the prowl, like a roaring lion seeking whom he shall devour that word. When it says be sober, if you look it up, it's also used in uh, the chapter before where it says watch unto prayer. It's the word watch. But when it says be sober, if you look up the Greek, it literally means abstain from wine, stay away from it. And so the Bible tells us there's things which we need to stay away from, stay away from ungodliness, stay away from worldly lust. We need to live soberly, righteously, godly in the present age. And what else should we do in the present age? What should we be teaching our children, our friends, strangers around us? That we are actually looking for, this is what we're waiting for under the New Testament, the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. And this is actually just like John chapter 1, verse 1, 
where Jesus is called God. This is actually another verse which calls Jesus the great God. Jesus is called our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own specialty people zealous for good works. So until Jesus comes in this present age, we need to abstain from these things. Okay, well, what do we need to start doing? You're saying we need to stop doing these things. What do we need to start doing? We need to start being zealous for good works. We need to start speaking these things, exhorting and rebuking with all authority. We need to act as if we're redeemed. If we believe Jesus redeemed us from our sin, but we're still living in sin, we're not living as if we're redeemed, and we need to repent of those things and stop doing dead works, evil works, and we need to start doing some good works. The Bible teaches that at the second coming of Jesus Christ from heaven, we're going to receive our eternal bodies. And it tells us our citizenship is in heaven. So you ask a Christian here, any Christian here, is your citizenship in heaven? Yes. But are you in heaven right now? No. But where is your ultimate? Where are you going to go? Where is your homeland? It's in heaven. That's where you're going to go. And it says from heaven, in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body. Jesus has a resurrected body. First Corinthians chapter 15. We read about that. And we also will be given a body like his and that our body will be spiritual, eternal, glorious. And so the idea, look at this. We know we're waiting for Jesus, but how are we waiting? Are we eagerly waiting? I know tomorrow's Monday. A lot of people have work. Are you eagerly waiting for work? What's that look like? Ugh, work tomorrow. That's not eagerly waiting. So the Bible tells us we should be eagerly waiting for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that goes to show the Bible says um, there's an appointed day that Jesus will judge For 2,000 years, that day hasn't came to pass, but who's not to say that 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 day is today? God knows when it is. We should be eagerly waiting as if that day is today. And you know what? How much more would that motivate us knowing Christ could come even today and I need to share the gospel with the lost? Christ could come in an hour. If I don't tell them the gospel within an hour, you know what? They won't have a chance. So having that motivation, eagerly waiting for Jesus Christ to come from heaven should enable us to share these promises that the promise that when Jesus comes, our lowly body will be conformed to his glorious body. First John chapter three, verse two and three tell us the same thing. Now he says, beloved, he's writing to Christians. That's why he calls them beloved. He says, now we are the sons of God. We're the children of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Do you want to be pure? I do. I'm sure all of us do. And it says if you want to be pure, you need to have this hope in you that when Jesus comes, you're going to be given your true identity in Christ. And so it says it does not yet appear what we shall be. When do we know what we shall be? Well, it will appear to you what you shall be when Jesus appears. This is hidden until Jesus appears. We know that we're going to be like him, but we don't know exactly what his glorious body is like that we are going to have. It does not yet appear what we shall be. What are you going to look like in that resurrected body? You don't know, but are you going to know? Yeah. When will it appear to you what you look like? When you see him, when he appears, because when you see him, you will be like him because you'll see him as he is. Jesus' second coming from heaven will mark the fulfillment of all things. We studied this verse, went into it in the book of Acts, and it says, heaven must receive Jesus until the time of restoration of all things. And we know at least that there's one promise which has not been fulfilled yet. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it's talking about um, the restoration of bodily death. There will come a time when bodily death is destroyed for everyone. We already read that spiritual death has been destroyed. We can have fellowship with God. Jesus restored that. We have access to the Father through his blood. Jesus came and he actually reversed the two deaths which Adam introduced into the world. Adam introduced spiritual sin into the world and also Adam introduced physical death into the world. Jesus already reversed spiritual death. We can have fellowship with God, but has physical death, bodily death been reversed for everyone yet? 
people are still dying. People are still going into the graves. The Bible says people are still sleeping. That's the term given for death. But it says the time will come when this corruption, talking about this physical, this body, must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, that hasn't happened yet. That's going to happen at the coming of Jesus from heaven. And look at this. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? Right now, we're going to look at it, but individuals, when they die, where do they go? The Bible says that individuals go to Hades. Jesus did not go to heaven when he died. How do we know that? Jesus resurrected out of Hades, and what did he tell his disciples when he resurrected, or the women? He said, do not touch me. I have not yet ascended to the Father. Jesus went to Hades. He did not go to the Father. On the day of Pentecost, we read that David was still in Hades. And so we read in uh, Acts chapter 2 also, David is still dead and buried at that time. Um, I think it's Acts chapter 13 says David served God in his own generation and he fell asleep. So David is still dead and buried. He's still sleeping. He's still in Hades. But there will come a time when Christ comes from heaven where death in Hades is destroyed and individuals will receive eternal life. Second Peter chapter three tells us that not only Hades is going to be destroyed, bodily death destroyed, but also the heavens and the earth are going to be destroyed. And this is second Peter chapter three, where it says, but the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, do not forget this one thing that with the Lord, one day is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. So it's been two thousand years since this was written. Guess what? In the Lord's mind, how long has that been? Two days. But beloved, do not, er, okay, sorry, verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering. He's patient toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God has promised the destruction of heaven and earth, and at that same time, he's going to judge the ungodly. Why has it been 2,000 years since then? Why has it not happened yet? Because he's long-suffering. God is patient toward us. He doesn't want anyone to be condemned. God wants everyone to come to a knowledge of the truth, to be saved, to come to repentance. But he says this, even though God is long-suffering, he's patient, God is still appointed a day in which he is ready to judge the living and the dead. And it says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. Hasn't happened yet, but guess what? It will happen. It will pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. So you ask us, what hope do we have then? If there's a destruction of this heavens and earth, what hope do we have? Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fer fervent heat. Nevertheless, he, according to his promise, here's the promise which we have. The heavens and the earth, which we're going to, which we're living on right now, will be destroyed, but we're going to be given a new heavens, a new earth, and this will be at the coming of Christ from heaven. We, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And it says, therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless and consider that the long suffering, the patience of our Lord is salvation. And so 2000 years has went by and we're. God, aren't you ready to judge the world and destroy the earth? That's what it seems everyone out in the world's waiting for is the end of the world near. I had someone message me the other day say, do you think that the end of the world is about to happen? I pointed them to this. It could happen at any time. But the reason it happened yet, hasn't happened yet is because God wants everyone to be saved. Um, and it could happen at any time. The world could end today or guess what? We could die today. One or the other is going to happen. If, if uh, we make it to tomorrow, guess what? Either we could die tomorrow or the world could end tomorrow. So either way, we need to prepare for it. First Thessalonians 4 um, tells us uh, the hope of the resurrection will occur and it will occur. Jesus is coming. Those who are dead in Christ, the dead Christians, we will all enter heaven at the same time they do. I do not want you to be ignorant concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. 
For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. What they were worried about here is the first century Christians, and you have Christians dying, and so the living Christians are worried. They're going to go to heaven before us. And he's saying that's not the case. You are going to enter heaven at the same time as them. You're not going to go to heaven before them. They're not going to go to heaven before you. It says the dead in Christ will rise first when Christ ascends from heaven. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Right now, I'm not with these dead Christians. But you know when I will be with them? Either when I'm dead or if Christ came and then I will be united with them. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us this also, that at Christ's coming, as in Adam all die. This is talking about bodily death. Because of Adam, everyone dies bodily. But through Jesus, everyone, whether wicked or righteous, will be resurrected bodily and face the judgment. Those who have done good, they will face the resurrection of, uh, they will receive eternal life. But those who have done evil, the resurrection of condemnation. Through Christ, all shall be made alive, each one in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, afterwards, those who are Christ at his coming. So what's this tell us? It says Jesus is the first one who died and was made alive. What does that tell us about those other Christians and even those who lived before them that had died? They're going to be made alive when? At his coming. That's when we receive our spiritual bodies. It says so also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. So here we are. We have this natural body today waiting for the resurrection. There is a natural body. There is a spiritual body. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural and afterwards the spiritual. What's that say? That means in order, if you want that spiritual body, you have to be born bodily, uh, physically the first time. And it tells us the first man was of the earth, made of the dust. That's reference to Adam. The second man is the Lord from heaven. That's reference to the body uh, which Jesus has. And it says, as was the man of dust, there is the body of Adam. So also are those who are made of dust. We are made in the image of Adam. We have the same body he did. And as is the heavenly, so also those who are heavenly. What's that tell us? That when we are resurrected, we won't have the body as Adam. But we will have the body as Christ. As we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Now this I say, brethren, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. What's this telling us? You can't go to heaven in your physical body. You need a spiritual body which lasts forever. You need an eternal body. You need an incorruptible body. Why? Because it tells us heaven is incorruptible. We have an inheritance there undefiled. And so we will bear his image. And this is the last verse, the last slide I want us to look at. And this tells us when that all will take place. When will the corruptible put on the incorruptible? He tells us, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Talking about we shall not all die. We read David's still sleeping. By the time I think it's Acts chapter 13, David fell on asleep after he served God in his generation. He's still dead. He's still buried. And this tells us that Christ will come when some individuals are still living on earth. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Even if you don't die bodily, if Christ came today, we're not missing out on anything. We're still, still going to get those bodies that the resurrected will without us dying. And it says in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. What's this tell us? That we receive those incorruptible bodies the same time as the dead when Christ comes. We're not missing out. They're not missing out. We both have that promise before us. And it says this corruptible must put on incorruption. If somebody tells you that the dead aren't going to rise, tell them the word of God says it must happen. 
This corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? This has not been fulfilled yet. When will this passage be fulfilled? At Christ coming from heaven, when bodily death is destroyed, those of us living will not die, but we will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, and this will all occur at the same time. Those who die, they have this promise before us. You know what? If I die today, Jesus says that he'll resurrect me out of the dead, and it will happen the same time all the other dead are resurrected. And you know what? Say I die today, Christ comes tomorrow. We're going to be reunited, have those uh, spiritual bodies and be with Christ forever in the air. We're all going to heaven just because an individual dies before another one doesn't mean they're missing out on the second coming of Christ. Second coming of Christ involves the dead. And so here, uh, this is the last slide that I have up here. And hopefully this has been an encouragement for us. A lot of this stuff's probably familiar. And, you know, a lot of individuals in the audience hear these things and just want to make a comment on it. That's good. That's exactly what this is meant for you to do, to stir up your minds, to think about God's word, think about spiritual matters. If there's something you have a question about or you're like, Jake, maybe this is different. Let's talk about it. God wants us to have discussion, to come together and to teach the truth. And so um, it's been an encouragement this morning. And so we have a hope before us, the second coming of Christ from heaven. If we love his appearing, let's share it with others. Let's share his first appearing. Jesus came, died for your sins, rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, established the church. If you believe the gospel and you obey it, um, there's teachings which go into that. We'd love to have a Bible study with you. You're added to the church at the point that you're baptized. And guess what? We're waiting for those new bodies which Jesus will give us at his second coming from heaven. And so let's keep this in mind. Be eagerly waiting as the scriptures say to do. If you have any need this morning to um, request prayer from the congregation or an announcement, we would love to uh, speak with you. Or if you have the need to be baptized, added to the church which Jesus established, we'd love to talk with you and conversate regarding that. Um, if you have any need, you can come to the front as we stand and sing.